Welcome to When I Grow Up, the podcast for conversations between students with goals and the people who have already achieved them. Brought to you by Higher Hopkins and Hopkins Connect at Johns Hopkins University. In this podcast, we match students for a conversation with their dream mentor. Here's our student host for today's episode. Hi, my name is Claire Iverson. I'm from Baltimore, Maryland. I study at Hopkins. So currently, I'm getting a Bachelor of Arts in International Studies and French and a Bachelor of Music in Voice Performance. Today, I'll be interviewing Claire Galloway. And I'm really looking forward to learning more about her career path and having that be a, a potential mentorship for my own. I'm Claire Galloway. I'm originally from outside of Philadelphia, but I currently live in Baltimore, Maryland. I have studied at Bard College, Boston University School of Education, and Peabody Conservatory. I am currently a freelance soprano. I am a diction professor at Peabody, and I also run some courses that work with singers on diction and breath support and creating their own career opportunities. Thank you for agreeing to to do this, to meet with me and talk a little bit. Yeah, definitely. Happy to be here and happy to talk to you. Okay, so first, could you tell me a little bit about your time in school um, and how you got to where you are now, specifically with your first few years out of school? So yeah, I, I came to Peabody in 2013 and it was after a stint where I had gone abroad and taught English in France, actually and decided that really what I wanted to do was pursue a career in voice. So I came back to school in music after quite a number of years and had to take some of the remedial theory classes. And through my two years there, I really fell in love with all kinds of new music that I hadn't been exposed to before. I had always studied the classics, the bel canto, the Mozart, the Verismo, And I'd always been passionate about art song as well, which was something that I cultivated a lot at Peabody and that afforded me a lot of performing opportunities. I was very lucky to be cast in two operas my second year as a mezzo, um, which was great. So I was able to get a lot of stage experience, but I was still working alongside of all of that to create my own opportunities to collaborate with some of my classmates because we had formed quite a tight bond. When I came out of school, I had colleagues that I wanted to collaborate with still, and I wanted to create more projects with. When it comes to the diction aspect of it, people at Peabody knew that I had an affinity for languages. They knew that I had studied French. In fact, I helped coach the French for the Dialogue of the Carmelites when we did it my first year. And so As I was leaving, our French diction teacher was retiring and moving back to Switzerland. And so Bob Muckenfuss came up to me and said, hey, you should apply. We're doing a national search. You know, there's going to be a lot of candidates, but you have a good background and you're a singer. So you should try and see what happens. So I applied and worked my way through the process and ended up getting hired, which was a huge honor. Yeah. And so essentially what that's meant for the years post master's degree is that I've continued kind of cobbling together performance opportunities with colleagues, as well as getting to delve into the language aspect and coaching singers in that, which I'm so, so passionate about. Do you think being in Baltimore affords you a lot of opportunities for performance? Or do you think if you had been based somewhere else, you would have preferred that in terms of creating your own performance schedule? I've been thinking a lot about this recently because of the pandemic and because of some conversations I've had with colleagues. You know, I often think, oh, Baltimore is struggling a little bit. You know, the opera company has closed. The symphony was having problems, although luckily they've signed their agreement for the next few years, which is great. A couple of the big choruses have closed. So I was worrying about it over the past year or so. But... Having had these conversations recently, the thing I realize more and more about Baltimore is how scrappy it is. It's a really small music community, but it's a community of people who are super innovative. They're looking for all the opportunities that can be created within the structure that we have. 
And so you have these incredible things just kind of pop up. I mean, there's currently a group that are putting together operas. I think it's Opera Alchemy at Peabody. And there was, um, right before I came in, there was something called the Figaro Project where they were creating their own operas as well. And then you have chamber ensembles that are popping up. You have people trying different boundary breaking things like out calls with Melissa Wimbish and Brett Wilson Ecker. And then you have all these people who are finding ways to do recitals on site in different places. So I think in some ways, because there aren't large institutions, there are smaller things that are more innovative popping up that allow for more opportunities for the younger local artists. And then you have the companies like Baltimore Concert Opera and Maryland Opera that are doing sort of larger scale things still in innovative ways. I mean, they're presenting opera in concert form. They're presenting it at the Engineers Club and the Pendry and all kinds of interesting places that Baltimore affords. So even though I've questioned it here and there, I've always been really grateful to be in a community like this that's always looking for the new ways to present something that's just going to make it possible to create art. How do you think, obviously this answer is going to be myriad, but what do you think the, the biggest impact the pandemic has had on your career path? Honestly, the possibility to teach online has opened up a huge amount of opportunity for me because I, at the beginning of the pandemic thought, well, what can I do to help people that's also going to keep me feeling productive and like I'm giving back or that I'm helping people. And so I thought about doing an addiction online course and that led to other things, which is now leading to a bigger program that I'm offering about creating your own opportunities. And I didn't quite realize how effective teaching online could be. Even teaching voice online can be incredibly effective and you can still affect a lot of change and growth and evolution in people. And it opens the doors to a much more global community. Some of the people that have participated in my program have been on the west coast of the US. Some of them have been in the Netherlands and Spain. So there's just much more possibility to connect with disparate groups of people, which is pretty incredible. And that allows for possibilities of collaboration too. I mean, especially if we're all kind of singing with tracks or even just layering over tracks with other people, it allows you to collaborate with people who live around the other side of the world. I'm not a technologically adept individual, um, but I will say learning how to, even just how to use iMovie has absolutely changed a lot for me, which is a struggle when I'm sitting there doing it, but pays off well. Well, yeah, I think a lot of us have not been trained in that kind of technology and <laughs> learning more how to do it opens up more possibilities for elaborate projects or even just simple projects where you're like, you know what, I really want to share this song and so I'm going to make it happen even if I just record it with my iPhone and upload it. So where, where I am right now, I'm looking at A, where the world will be in the next year, but aside from that, just generally what I want to be doing and I don't want to go to grad school right away I'm not applying for voice programs because I want a little bit of time between my undergrad and my grad school um, really? to, to make some money and to kind of refresh myself and then to be able to go into grad school a financially able to support myself and be ready to actually learn the most from that but that leaves the question of what I want to be doing in the next few years. And I've been thinking about ways that I can combine my biggest interests, which are music, language, similar to yours. Um, what advice would you, would you give me in terms of figuring all of that out? So first of all, I highly commend your thought process. I took some time off after undergrad. I ended up going and getting a different degree in French education. Um, and I remember coming into Peabody being really worried about that because I was like, oh, I'm coming in, I'm older and I don't know what's gonna happen with that. But then being really grateful for the experience that I had had over the past six or so years because I had become more of a 
worldly person, right? I understood what it was like to pay rent and worry about my job applications that were not just singing related. So I think that's a really, really good job idea. Um, there's a multitude of things that you can do with your passion for languages. I mean, considering the state of travel right now, travel might be difficult, but you could still find ways to go to different parts of the country where you're using your language. You could look into different ways to work with nonprofits if you wanted to, so that you can learn a little bit more of the back end of what we see um, as artists, especially if you wanted to get a little bit more familiar with how the business process works for nonprofits. But it could be something that's completely unrelated to music. It could be that you're helping people out who are immigrating or learning English for the first time because you have so many languages under your belt. You could also look into education. Um, education is a tricky field, as are many <laughs> in our day and age, but it does afford you unexpected opportunities, kind of like getting a French ed degree ended up leading to me teaching French diction, which I hadn't even thought of when I went to get my degree. So yeah, I think there's a lot of a lot of opportunities. You also with your language skills and I th some of our applicable skills from being a musician would afford you possibilities in industries that you probably wouldn't even think about, whether that was medicine or law or business or real estate, whatever it is, we have a lot of transferable skills as musicians and we don't realize it because it's just baked into us as we're working. <laughs> And they make us really good employees. And so again, kind of getting an idea of something that's completely outside of the musician realm can lend you good business ideas and entrepreneurial ideas for your career later on. Okay. So the world is your oyster. I'll put it that way. Okay. Thank you. That is, that is helpful in terms of just how I want to structure my, my thoughts about May and onwards. Yeah. Yeah. Have you had any moments of just total lack of motivation in terms of learning music and booking performances over these last couple months as we've kind of totally changed how we operate as singers? Yeah. <laughs> Point blank, yes. Um, especially when the pandemic began and all of us were starting to try to figure out Zoom and I was trying to teach three classes on Zoom and also try to take care of myself and take care of the students' needs. I would sit down at the piano to record tracks for some of my students, and that was pretty much all I could make myself do because it was something I had to do <laughs> um, to help others, really. It, it, was, it was more whenever I had to work on music for myself or for something that was potentially coming up, I had zero motivation whatsoever. I felt like my voice was not working properly, and I knew what I could do to fix it and had zero motivation to do it. So what helped me with that is first of all, giving myself permission to take some time away. I continued recording those tracks for students. I continued doing my teaching work and giving feedback to students, which gave me some energy. But in that time, I kind of said, okay, like the most that I will do is maybe listen to some pieces that I might want to start working on. And then as I started getting back into singing, um, I have a good friend of mine, Robin McGinnis, who works in Peabody Launchpad. And Robin and I set up weekly studio Zooms. Robin's out in Arizona right now. And so we would sing for each other and give each other feedback, which is something we did when Robin was still in Baltimore. And that was my main motivation. And then having more external things like I had an invitation to Ravinia this year to be a studio fellow, which was very exciting. And of course it wasn't going to be in person this year, but they very kindly offered a online week. So I knew that was coming in August. And so I had that external, you better know your music and you better be on top of it. So I slowly started setting external goals for myself with the knowledge that one of the big ones was coming. But I will say after Ravinia too, it was really hard to keep going. So I was like, well, I don't know what the next thing is. So again, I'm kind of setting external goals. I have a few things that are coming in from the outside, which is nice, but I'm also setting up times when I'm going to do live stream recitals. So again, I know I need to be on top of it and I know that my voice needs to be in good shape. So yeah, anything that you can achieve, even if it's a teeny tiny piece of the puzzle, give yourself 
a win for the day. Yeah, that's that's really that's really good advice. What is like a goal house for you? What's a house that you've been looking at and you really want to get get involved with? That's a great question. My I think all of us kind of come through school going the Met, the Met, right? <laughs> but especially seeing what's going on with the Met right now, it's like, well, I don't know how that's going to work out. Um, so the Met's always been in the back of my mind, but I personally would love to travel to Europe and do some performing at um, Covent Garden. I just because of my connection with Strasbourg and walking past the opera house all the time and going to see some of my favorite artists there, I would love to sing there someday. It's a beautiful space and it's pretty small, um, but very gilded and French. <laughs> Yeah, the thing about the American opera houses is that they are massive. And I would say that I have a decently sized voice, but I don't know that I would sing big roles at any of the big houses, including the Metropolitan. So I tend to look at sort of scaled down houses like Opera Delaware and places like that. That's definitely on my list as well. It's a beautiful space and um, the company's run by a Peabody alum, Brendan Cook, which is very cool. And they do some great stuff. So yeah, I think sort of about the mid-sized houses in the, in the U.S. And I also think that they're the more innovative houses, like Opera Philadelphia is doing the coolest stuff with their festivals. So that's definitely on my list. And I'm a Philly girl. So I'm like, let's go. And then some of the, the houses in Europe as well. What's something that you would change about your career as it currently exists? Yeah, I mean, so I would love to be performing opera more. I think that that's a, a an untimely wish <laughs> at the moment. I definitely could look into creating my own kind of opportunity, which is what I preach to everybody, especially considering that we're all going to be doing it remotely. Um, but that's definitely something that's on the bucket list. I would love to be performing more more opera. And I, I can tell you that I would have said a few years ago, the thing I would love to change about my career is I wish I were younger or that I'd started younger. But as I keep going, I don't agree with that anymore. I think that my experience outside of the opera world has made me more well-rounded and I have a very different perspective than a lot of my colleagues. And so I can come at it with a different perspective and passion. So I'm over regretting that. <laughs> and I'm also very much advocating, especially right now, as the opera world has to change, that young artist programs get rid of age limits or change the way that age limits work because they are doing no one any favors. But obviously the Fulbright is quite competitive. And so I've been looking at other things that are similar to that in nature, whether that be a teaching position or a study research position. But as of right now, it's difficult to find one year to two year opportunities like that. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. No, I think all of those are good possibilities. Um, TAPIF would be a great opportunity for you. T-A-P-I-F. And so, yeah, they are looking for people who have at least proficient French. You don't have to be fluent. And I know that your level is quite high um, to go over to France to teach English in various high schools. The nice thing about the French school system too is that the teaching assistants start, I think we started in October. So it was briefly after they had started their year so that they could get established before they met the teaching assistants. And then we finished briefly before they finished their school year. So I think we finished in late April, early May. And in France, they have vacations every two months for two weeks. So within that time, I was traveling all over the place. And I even took a couple auditions in Munich. And I went up to Amsterdam to take an audition. So it really gives you a lot of space because you're not teaching a huge number of hours either. You have a lot of time to explore. You have a lot of time to, to look into different opportunities to travel like you love to do. Um, would you say that there is an age that is too young to be auditioning for certain houses, certain programs? Um, and I say this, from a, I, I ask this from a very specific personal place because I um, got accepted to Open Fest Prague last summer, mm -hmm. uh, weighing 
and, and one of the, the cornerstones of that summer program is that you get seven in-house auditions with all of the opera houses in the Czech Republic. And I was weighing whether or not 21 was far too young to be auditioning for these specific houses um, or if I should just go for it and not expect anything but get my foot in the door, have my my resume shared, anything like that. But would you would you what would you counsel in terms of age and auditioning? I think that it's very variable depending on the person. With a program like Opera and Fest Prague, where you're auditioning for a bunch of houses, my question would be, do you get feedback from the houses? Or are they just saying, she's great, I'll hire her, or like, no, no thank you. Um, because if you're getting feedback, that's really valuable. It could also be incredibly confusing if you're hearing feedback from seven different houses because they're all gonna have different opinions about what you should sing, what you should do, what you should wear, whether you're too young, whether you're developed enough with your technique, but the feedback could be helpful to kind of cull and, and pull together. Then the other question is, if one of them did say, oh my gosh, I love her, I wanna hire her for our entire season as a young artist and I want her to sing these five roles, you have to know yourself if you're up to that. And I don't mean like whether you're up to memorizing all of it and performing it and taking in the stage directions and working with different conductors. I mean, is your technique up to it? And is that what you want to do right now? Or do you think that you should maybe go live a life elsewhere and get a little bit more experience in the real world? Um, because I don't think there's a right or wrong answer across the board. I think it's a very individual decision. So if you feel like I'm ready to go, my technique feels pretty solid, I'm interested in exploring, and I definitely want to be performing in Europe, then cool. And you also could get that offer and say, I'm not ready. Thank you so much. I'd love to stay in touch with you. Yeah, and I will say too, like it's a great opportunity to audition in Europe and try auditioning in front of different companies and try out different things. What I would encourage you to do when you do sing for them is don't worry about what they're thinking. And this is across the board for any audition. Don't worry what they're thinking. Go in with your own very specific goal for yourself for that day. Like say you're singing governess and there's one part of it that really challenges you, whether it's a dramatic aspect where you're like, I'm not really sure what she's thinking here, or man, this high note is the worst, or I never get this low note out. Go out with the goal that you're gonna focus on that thing and focus on the technical or the dramatic inspiration behind it so that you can walk out of that audition room going, yeah, I achieved my goal for today. If they say no, that's their personal preference and I can walk out of the room feeling proud of what I did today. Do you ever wish that you had not decided to pursue music and opera and instead stayed on either the education track or like strictly education track or something completely and totally different? I would be lying if I said no. There have definitely been times. They tend to be very fleeting, to be honest with you. And they have definitely come up more in the pandemic where it's kind of like, well, what's the future of our career look like? But then I keep remembering why I enjoy singing and why I enjoy music. And a lot of that comes from being able to share stories with a community and collaborate with other musicians. And that's possible at any level. You know, like I don't have to have won a bunch of competitions or been able to sing at one of those goal houses to share music and to touch people in an emotional way and feel connected to them. So that's what keeps coming back into my brain whenever I have those down moments and they do happen. Um, and then I also remember too that it's not in a box. Like there's, there's opportunity outside of the singing aspect of it. Like I've been able to teach French and Italian diction and explore other types of languages too, which I, you know, I'm a nerd about. So sang a whole recital in Scandinavian languages last year, which was so much fun. 
So there's possibility to, to bring it all together and to be an educator and to be an entrepreneur and to be a nonprofit person who runs your own company, but is still benefiting others. So I would just say, always look for the opportunity within what you're doing. And remember that if you decide that what fulfills your musical side is singing in a church or is just singing a song on YouTube, that's not a failure. And if anyone tells you it is, then tell them to go away because they don't know what they're talking about. You get to define what feels successful to you. Do you feel like you can balance your time well between your teaching obligations, um, both for Peabody and for independent voice lessons with your own students and finding all the time that you need in order to practice, learn music, find opportunities, audition, perform, et cetera? I will say it's a balancing act. And I will say I'm a procrastinator, which I think a lot of creative people are. So what I tend to do is put things that are easy to check off my to-do list first. And those aren't always the things that I need to do in my own practicing. I also am someone who tends to put other people's needs first. That's just kind of who I am. And so I do often find myself going, okay, well, I've created all of these tracks for my students and isn't that great? And I check them off my to-do list and then I look at the clock and it's 11 p.m. and I'm like, wow, I didn't touch my rep at all today. So I just have to keep reminding myself to prioritize my practice and to literally put it on my to-do list or I won't do it. <laughs> um, and then also to be gentle with myself if I don't get to my own practicing because in teaching my students and in working on things for them, I am still working on my own musicianship and craft and knowledge of the repertoire. Do you feel like post master's degree, do you feel like you are always comfortable with your technique or do you feel like you're spending a lot of time still thinking about technique rather versus like musicianship or all the other myriad aspects that go into, into performance? Yeah, I will admit that I ended up going to a new teacher after I left Peabody and I had a wonderful time with Steve Rainbow, but I was really struggling with a couple of things still, especially being a mezzo. I would walk into a lot of auditions and they would be like, are you sure you're a mezzo? And even every once in a while, Steve would be like, are you, uh, maybe we should play with, I don't know. Um, and so I got to a point of frustration um, and not with Steve, but with the, the auditioning world. And Steve was thinking about retiring anyway. And so I kind of went, you know, I want to go talk to somebody who's still performing themselves and who has students who are performing at a high level. So I reached out to a friend who'd been studying with someone for a while, went and had a lesson with him. And basically was looking for him to say like, stop trying or I can help you. <laughs> and luckily it was, I can help you. You have some great raw materials. So I would say that I tend to over fixate about my technique over the past few years. It's become incredibly solid and I can feel that my baseline has moved up. So even on my bad days, I can walk in and sing a decent audition. And what the struggle's been since that baseline is rising is to stop worrying about it so much and to give myself over to the character and the musicianship of it. So that's become my new struggle is to just stop worrying about the technique and to give myself over to the art. Um, do you deal with stage fright or do you look, do you enjoy singing in front of people or does it bring you more anxiety than it does joy, whether that be before or in the moment or whatever? Um, I don't really deal with stage fright. I really enjoy singing in front of people because I feel their energy and it amps me up. I will say that it used to be that I would get a lot of adrenaline rush and I would almost feel like there was a little bit of reflux happening um, before going out on stage. And it always happens like the second before. And so what I've started doing is kind of breathing calmly um, or saying a mantra to myself, something like that. But the other thing that's really helped me a lot and something that I say to students a lot when they're worried about stage fright and getting up in front of people is 
and I know this sounds counterintuitive, but the more you do it, the less you worry about it because it becomes routine. So it used to be that before I walked into auditions, like the first real in-person auditions I did were the first fall I was at Peabody because I realized that I should be applying to all these summer programs and young artist programs. And I panicked before all of them. I was just like, oh my God, I have to walk into this room and I have to sound perfect. And like, there's this panel of people who are staring at me and sometimes they're like two feet away from me because we're in a tiny room. And um, the more I started doing it, the more I was just like, okay, here we go. Another audition, another set of people. What happens, happens. And so if you can give yourself more opportunities to get up in front of people, I think that it, like I said, becomes a part of your routine where it doesn't feel like it's totally alien and you don't get as panicked about it. But yeah, I highly recommend if you're someone who deals with that stage fright, find a routine yourself before you go out and do it. Find a way to stretch or even go for a run. Some people feel better if they've gotten a little bit more cardio um, or just do some deep breathing and give yourself a focus. Some people give themselves a mantra. Some people give themselves adjectives. I know Rachel willis sorensen has been talking about her adjectives for Violetta recently. So find ways to just focus in where it's blocking out the, the rest of the room. Are there parts of the music and opera world as a whole that you dislike or that you would want to change? Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot that needs to be talked about and I'm, I'm happy actually that that's happening right now during the pandemic because things were not in great shape before the pandemic and are in pretty horrible shape during the pandemic. So I am looking at this as a time for change where artists can be super open with the administration because a lot of the issues come from the shift away from artists being in charge and the shift towards the administration being in charge, but also being at the beck and call of directors and also being at the beck and call of donors, because that means that we're seeing the same pieces performed over and over and over again, instead of hearing more of our contemporary stories and seeing more of what our actual modern society looks like and sounds like on stage. So that in addition to the issues with age limits and starting to cast more based on what people look like on screen instead of what they sound like, um, I have a real bee in my bonnet about the Fox system. I think it's way too strict. I think it boxes people in. And every single mezzo I know has walked into an audition room and been asked, are you sure you're not a soprano? Every single one. So at a certain point, it shouldn't matter. If you can sing a role well, and if you can bring your unique story to that, then go for it. And there's, there's singers out there doing that. Isabel Leonard sings both. Julia Bullock doesn't even list what Bach she is. She just says, Julia Bullock, singer. For young singers, do you think that, that doing something like that could be detrimental to their progression within the, within the opera world, given that it is so strict? The, yeah, the problem is that young artist programs are usually looking for one soprano, one mezzo, one tenor, one bass to sing all of these roles. So if you go in without distinguishing what you are, I don't know what they think of that. I would still encourage you to do it and see what happens. Um... The bigger issue is if you go to Germany, that's where they're really, really strict about Fox. And if they see something outside of your Fox on your audition list, they kind of go, oh, the singer doesn't know their own voice. They're too young, they're too green, whatever. And that's especially because they tend to be fest contracts where you're there and you sing like 10 roles in a season. But even those 10 roles aren't gonna be within one Fox. They're just not. So, it's tricky to say for young artists because I think that Fox are supposed to be a starter's guide to what you will sing in your career. 
but I don't want it to box people in. I can't say confidently that if you don't list it, people will be accepting of that. But that's something that I wish would change. This has been really helpful for me because especially with where we are right now, I have no idea what I want to be doing. But given that I am dual degree, dual enrolled, I still have so much work that I'm, that I'm working on for school. And so I yeah. haven't had all that much time to look for job opportunities or even just sit down and think about what I want to be doing to section off a portion of time that is just let me think about and, and, and have an open conversation about and brainstorm these possibilities and these ideas. And like I said, I don't know if you're a to-do list person or a schedule person, but if you can give yourself like 15 minutes every couple of days to just do some research and think about, like it literally could just be sitting around thinking. Well, thank you. Yeah. Glad to be here. You've been listening to When I Grow Up, the podcast for conversations between students with goals and the people who have already achieved them. Brought to you by Higher Hopkins and Hopkins Connect at Johns Hopkins University. Thank you to our When I Grow Up podcast team and all the people who make this podcast possible, including our editor, Thomas Nishimoto, our host students, and all of our guests.